Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Legacy Speaks. I am so excited to have this wonderful guest of mine. He has played an influential part within my LPC or LAPC career from the time that I started grad school to even now. And he's just been like a very good voice within the community with regards to mental health awareness and advocacy. So I really would like to introduce you guys, Dr. Sutherland of the Sutherland Center. Welcome Dr. Sutherland. Good. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate you. It's good. Always good to see you again and talk with you. I'm glad you're definitely progressing in your career from your times at West Georgia. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, yes, yes. So, Dr. Sutherland, can you tell the people who you are, what you do, and what populations you serve? Gotcha. First and foremost, I'm a father and a husband, which I enjoy mostly, immensely. That's what I do primarily to make sure I'm taking care of my household. Making sure I'm being available for my children and my wife and looking out for my nieces and nephews. That's the main part of what I do. Make sure my family is good. Looking out for my fraternity brothers as well, the men of Phi Biggest Sin Fraternity, New Phi Chapter, West Georgia. But in addition to that, on the business side, I run a company called the Sutherland Center, which I started in June of 2007. I've been in the field for since all about, about 20 years or so. Started off working at Inner Harbor Hospitals and working at Ridgeview Institute. Did some work at Murphy Hearts, Murphy Heart Hospitals. Did some work with Family Intervention Specialists, different contract companies. But I started my company in 2007, and my company is 100% in-home services. Currently serving 11 counties in Metro Atlanta, Georgia. Think of every county you can think of, from Fulton, DeKalb, Cobb, Clayton, Carroll County, Gwinnett, as far as Cartersville, all 11 counties in Metro Atlanta doing in-home therapy, individual couples and family therapy, the Sutherland Center. Is that what I do? I bring the service to the people. And I told my mom years ago that I was going to open up my own company and, and going to make house calls. She told me that's what doctors used to do a long time ago. Mm-hmm. They came with this black bag and they came into the home to service the family. I don't have a black bag. I have a black notebook that I come with providing service to the people. I really enjoy it. My company is 100% self-pay. I do take healthcare spending accounts, but the majority of my clientele pay by cash, credit card, and that, that aspect. So even cash out, some people do cash out. And really enjoying it. Wanted to find a way. My research in the history of what I do is my, my dissertation research when I did my Doctoral studies, studies at Argosy in Sarasota, Florida, in counseling psychology. I looked at my title, of my dissertation was The Effects of Father Absence on Delinquent Behavior of African American Males. And mm-hmm. I wanted to look at the relationship between fathers who were emotionally involved, physically involved, and a combination of, of both, and see its impact on the young men ages 12 to 17. And throughout all the research, like I'm quite sure most mental health professionals know, the emotional absence is caused the most traumatic for the young men. It's, it's better for their dad never been in their life than to see them every single day. Mm. The dad goes to watch TV or read the paper or read magazines while the kid is in another room playing games or whatever. And there's not that real strong emotional connection of engaging with each other. And that's the most traumatic. Even dads who are in the military and the family still able to have a connection with the dad through video conferencing or writing letters, that emotional connection still kept the relationship intact. And even the young men who fathers had passed at an early age, the families who spoke highly of the dad say, you know, you look just like your dad. Your dad would be so proud of you. He'd be want to be so happy with the things that you're doing. When the family spoke highly of the father to the boys, that emotional connection still kept them moving forward, mm-hmm. even though they didn't have them physically present. So the Sutherland Center provides individual couples and family counseling to strengthen the foundation for families to reconnect fathers to their children. That's the foundation of what we do. In addition to that, I do clinical supervision for super for those who are seeking licensure in the state of Georgia. I do clinical consultation and continue education workshop for mental health professionals. Been doing it for a long time. I really enjoy the work immensely as far as doing work in the school system at times, going to different PTAs and talking to families, trying to help the parents get a better relationship with their children. One of the workshops I've done in the school system is called the Lost Child and Loving Parent. Mm. 
Mm. And that's really the foundation from the Luke, Luke 15 of the prodigal son. Yeah. The parents are struggling with their child who is oppositional at times at school, maybe even some opposition at home, and how we can keep the parents to keep loving on their child, to keep pushing in as the children are pulling away. And we encourage them to push in. That's just one of the foundation workshops that I do. And then the elements of fatherhood is all about helping the parents and the dads particularly, even the young men who are middle school age and high school age who eventually will become fathers to be marriageable ready to push into the lives of their children to make sure they're always developed for them. But now the Sutherland Center started in 2007, just reminding you again, just the service we provide. It's an in-home service we provide. Mm -hmm. Enjoy what I do. I have a few people that I pull in from time to time to do some work for me. The primarily work is fulfilled by myself. That's awesome. And I really appreciate the fact that you were able to take something that's so important to you, which is family, and just kind of find your own niche and create your own lane. Um, and it definitely exudes in the work that you do. And so how have you been able to take your life experiences and, and combine it with to create, I guess, a therapeutic approach for the clients that you serve? Yeah, the foundation of what I do, one of the primary things I do with the family is to get them to be engaged. One of the pieces that I'll do with them is a thing called 168. Mm -hmm. 168 is all about time. There's typically, there's actually 168 hours in a week. Mm -hmm. And when we gauge the family on the amount of time that they're spending, whether reading together, playing together, walking together, watching TV together, watching movies together, playing games together, or even sitting down at the table together, which I'll come back to in a moment, yeah. How much time are they actually spending? And the majority of the families that I've worked with, whenever there's a disconnect, whenever the kid is engaging in substance abuse or the family member may be engaged in addiction on video games or porn addiction, it's usually, usually because the family is disconnected. Mm. I, I'm big on family systems, big on families pulling back together. It's not the individual well, it may be the identified client, maybe the adolescent or the parent or whatever, but it's all about pulling them together. And we sit down and we take a moment to listen to each other. We take a moment and walk, walk through what does it look like to really communicate with each other, to be heard and understood with trust. That's yeah. what I call the hut, being heard, understood with trust. And we sit the family together. And, the, you know, the, there's different theories out there for what we do in our field from reality therapy to person-centered therapy to cognitive behavior therapy, dialectic behavior therapy, so many different theories out there, which are all wonderful. And we get trained and we go learn and go to continue education workshop about all of them. Mm -hmm. From my understanding, all theories cover three things. Right. Thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Mm -hmm. As you do the work that you do, you address the client's cognitions and what you do. And when you ask them simply, what do you think about when you realize that your son is struggling in school and yet you haven't been there. What is the thoughts that come to your mind? Or even ask them, what is the feeling that you get when you realize that your child is hungry for a time with you and yet you're not able to provide it at this time? And you can just ask it directly. I'm really big on just strengthening the family and bringing the family back together. You can do all kinds of interventions because I do in home. Yeah. We sit down on the sofa together and we have a session. There are times we'll go for a walk as a family, we'll meet at a park. And we'll talk about what role does going to the park play in our family, in your mm -hmm. family, to strengthen your family. You can be sitting on the, on the park benches while the kids are swinging, but are y'all really engaged with, your, with each other? Are y'all walking and, and getting on the swings together? What role does sitting down at the table play in your family? But all the interventions are designed to get the families to reconnect right. in the normal confines of their home. You can do interventions outside the home, which is great. Right. Majority in the home, whether they doing whatever they doing at home. We right. bring them right back to the foundation. I believe from my perspective, the stronger that you can build up your home, when the when the families are built and strong together, then they can they, they come together, then they scatter into the community. The kids go to school, the parents go to work. And with all those teachings that the family has done, you're building up those schools where the kids go, you're building up the workplace where the parents are. And that will impact your community, mm -hmm. that will impact your city, that will impact your state, and it will strengthen the foundation for the nation. But it must begin with the family at the home.
And right. that's why I enjoy what I do by going to the home. Right. And how have you been able to adapt to the recent changes in the family dynamic, um, particularly with working with um, clients or families where the kid is basically a latchkey kid, where the parents are constantly working. They really don't necessarily have time for the kid because they're really focused on working from paycheck to paycheck to provide for the home. Um, how have you been able to kind of help them restructure the way that they approach um, the therapeutic process? Great question. My sessions are usually in the evening time once the kids are out of school. Mm -hmm. And majority of the time, most adults work, what, seven, eight to about five or six in the evening. And my sessions are set up where I'm coming to the home eight o'clock at night, six mm -hmm. o'clock at night. So I've even had a session start at 1030 at night. Oh, wow. And it's during the time where that is convenient for the family where we can sit down together. My initial appointment is about a 90 minute to two hour appointment. It's a combination of an assessment, but also we put in the work on that session mm -hmm. to put the family, to restructure the family, to begin to strengthen the foundation of the family on that first session. So it's regardless of what we do, I don't, most of my clients are all in the evening. Yeah. You can't say, well, I'm at work, I'm at work, or the kids are at school, they are extracurricular. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll come after. <laughs> we can work right there. So we yeah. find a way, if, it's, if this is really what you want to do, which usually they do, and we come together during those hours. I've been at folks' homes at midnight before. And because I'm self-paid, most of the time, if you put, put in for managed care, so you're at somebody's house at midnight, right. more than likely it's not gonna authorize that kind of stuff. But yes. You do what you gotta do to strengthen the foundation of family mm -hmm. and make it work. Awesome. And going back to the elements of fatherhood, I really, really love that whole entire aspect, um, particularly when it comes to dealing with all of the, the violence that we see on a consistent basis in the news against um, males of color. How are you strengthening black men to be able to step into and maintain the role as the, the father figure within the home? Yes. It's a challenge at times because usually it's majority of the time it's the mother who schedules the appointments. I do have several men mm -hmm. who call and schedule the appointments. And a lot of those men haven't had a positive role model of themselves. Yeah. And they would simply say, hey, Doc, I really don't know what to do to help my child out. And they'll be that trans, because when I go, I'll meet with the, the, the kids one-on-one, -on -one, I'll meet with the parents one-on-one, -on -one, and I pull the family together, we talk to, as, together as a family, and the dads will, will be honest, man, and just, I, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And, and it get really emotional because myself, my dad abandoned my mom and my sister and I when I was like three months old. Mm -hmm. I didn't meet my dad till I, the first time till I went to Chicago for the Signals 100 in 2014. I had a layover in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We were going to D.C. I made it for the first time in 2014. So I can, I can really connect with the dads not really fully understanding what they can do. Yeah. But I remind them the simplest thing you can do is to push in. Push into the lives of your children and be present. The, imagine if you went to, you come home, you know, you, it, the phrase that I use a lot is, is save some for home. Mm -hmm. The men will go to work and work 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 hours a week and then come home and be emotionally tired, be physically tired, spiritually tired, and we expect the families to understand, which they will. You know, the family's not gonna just, hey, you working too much. They will, but they'll show it through their behavior. They'll just, you doing too much, you're not available for us. And yet the family will show some understanding for that because he's still providing financially, he's there for whatever he's there a little bit. But imagine that was a reverse. Imagine you go to your boss, your supervisor, you say, boss, I done spent 40, 50 hours with my family. I ain't got nothing to give you at work. Yeah. Your boss ain't going to be understanding. Right. But reminded the, the dads, as well as you can, to save some for home. Save some of your emotional energy for home. Mm. To listen to your spouse, to listen to your children. Save some of the energy that you need to be able to read with your children, to pray with your children to attend your children's games when they have an, act, an activity, to go sit down and have lunch with them. Do you ever see any differences based on gender in terms of the relationship between the father and son and the relationship between the father and the daughter? 
it's equal from my perspective. He still needs to put in the time on time with the daughter and time with the son. You know, if, you, if the dad's too much time is not spent with his daughter, she's going to go seek it from another man. Right. We had that dialogue of, of the importance of dating your daughter, but also dating your son as well. Date your daughter, you know, and having the conversation of what role do you, what are the values, morals, and beliefs and philosophies about daughterhood and, and manhood and about fatherhood that you want your children to see and know? What do you want to pour into your children? When your daughter is going out with a man, do you expect the man to open the door for her? Do you currently open the door for her? Do you expect that how you're treating her mother, whether you are married to it or not, and they get to see that model, how are you setting that up? Right. You expect, what do you have, what do you expect for yourself that you expect your daughter to have an expectation mm -hmm. of whatever man that she decides to engage in a relationship with? Will he bring her flowers? I'll speak from my perspective. My daughter's 10 years old, and we've been going to a princess ball every year in February since she was two years old. Yeah. We do that. That's one of our traditions every single year. Now, we go on other dates as well. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest one that we go to when she get to dance up and have the little fairy princess and the horse carriage ride and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We've been doing it since she was two. Every time we go to Waffle House, she likes to go to Waffle House. <laughs> sit at the bar and have a conversation. She likes Golden Corral as well. We'll go and sit and talk, and I'll spend time with each of my children individually. We'll go hang out together individually. Because I've walked my clientele through it, I would definitely not even attempt to ask my clientele or even share that kind of information with my clientele if I wasn't doing it myself. Yeah. It's super important to give the time because that time is going to go quick. They only spend 17 years being a child. And they're going to spend, if they live in V92, they're going to live like 70-something years as an adult. Right. The time is now for you to give it to them. And either you're going to save some home, save some for home now, or you're going to be trying to catch up later on. But it's still significant to give the time to them. Right. And so with regards to the changes in how kids are growing up today, Obviously, um, we're dealing with social media and the gaming disorder and things like that. What advice do you give or, or how do you work with parents who are trying to um, build that relationship with their child, but also parents well in the midst of like the, the comparison on social media, um, the distractions and the addictions from gaming disorder? How do you work with that? Yes. And as well as we can, the preventive measure is to catch it early, mm -hmm. to spend time early. I mentioned earlier, one of the foundation questions I asked my fam the families is, particularly the dads, is what are the values, the morals, the beliefs, the philosophies about manhood do you want your son to know? Mm -hmm. About womanhood do you want your daughter to know? I have some dads say, so, you know, I want my son to be responsible. You got to define what that means for me because your son may not know what it is. Your daughter may not know what it is. Right. You want them to know as they transition into adulthood, as they go from being boy to a young man to a full grown man, from a little girl to a young girl to a young woman to a full woman. What do you want them to know? Mm -hmm. There are many times I've even gone and, and they haven't even taught their son how to shake a hand. They yeah. All, you to dap up and all that little sit, eat, 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 all that. Oh, can he make a nice firm shape? You never shake a man hand sitting down. Right. And that's a part of when I walk with the, the simplest things that you want your children to know. Yeah. I'm making sure that you are giving your kids a hug and a kiss every day. What do you want them to know? Being able to teach your son how to tie a tie. You can even teach your daughter how to tie a tie. What is it that you want them to know as they transition? If you say, I want my child to know how to be responsible by keeping their room clean, doing their homework, and yet you haven't taught them how right. to do it, how right. can you expect them to know how to do it? Well, I told them how to do it. <laughs> Telling and teaching are two different things. What right. are you teaching them? And then you, you go back to if you have expected that and you taught that, then you should allow them to show it to you. You can intercede. A lot of the kids are playing games. Play the games with them. Everybody know you can just play the games with the kids, but you still bought the games for them. If you allow the kid to play the games for hours on end, it's interfering with time that you're having with them. If you want that to happen, you're going to get the results of that. Even who kids who are playing football, baseball, basketball, or any gymnastic, all the sporting events that they're doing, 
if the kids have more of a social life than you have, that's a problem from my perspective. Mm -hmm. There, if you're spending time driving the kids to all these events, you got fast food, you eat quick, you jump in the car, you watching kids, you're like, well, it's for the kids. All that is great. I have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. But also, we know the more engaged and the more connected the family is, the better it is for the kids in the long run. You don't have to allow your kids to be engaged in those activities every season. They can do fall, take off spring. They can do spring and take off fall where you're still giving time where you're all connected with each other. All that is about time. Right. There's only 168 hours in a week. And I've done the activity with dads before and even the moms. And I would have them. This is one of the things that I cover in my continuing education workshop. Mm -hmm. Struggle No More Counselors Ethical Connection and Counseling, bro. You have to map out how many hours did you spend last week working? And you have to write that. Since there's 168 hours in a week, you got to write down how many hours you spent working. On average, people work 40. All right, 40. How many hours did you spend last week sleeping? On average, people sleep 56. If you subtract that 40 and that 56 from that 168, that leaves you 72 hours left over. Mm -hmm. Then I ask you, how much time did you spend with your daughter, Sierra? How much time did you spend? How much time did you spend with your son? How much time did you spend with your spouse? How much time did you spend with yourself? Right. Engaging in whatever you want to call self-care. I'll come back and define self-care in a moment. But it's how much time did you spend doing whatever you want to do for you and your family to strengthen the foundation for the family? Right. And I've had people write down one hour. One hour they spent with their spouse, their kids, last week, the last 168 hours. And what we do is we make a commitment for the next 168. Yeah. How much time we going to work, sleep, spend time with myself, spend time with my family, my kids, whichever one you want to do. And we make a commitment going forward. It's a future focus right. to do better because we all can do better. Exactly. And it definitely creates a, an increased level of mindfulness when you're literally having them break it down. And then um, it's just creating also goals for the future. It's just so many different components right there in that one activity. And I think that's simply amazing. Going back to teaching, because you are also a, a teacher by trade. Um, and you, you talked about your ethics course and whatnot. Can you provide additional information regarding that? Yes, the continuing education workshop I do struggle no more. A counselor's ethical connection in counseling is all about using, looking at the two ethical codes from ACA mm -hmm. and how we can strengthen the foundation for the family. The workshop is super interactive. You're going to connect and interact with the participants in the workshop. And the key part about the workshop, it's what you're going to you're going to think about what you're going to do for your clientele going forward but also what you're going to do for your own family in your home. That's the foundational part of it. We'll watch some videos. I'll talk about some of the realities of therapy. I did some reality television shows. I was on Real Housewives of Atlanta in 2014, season six, episode 21. I did a session with Candy and her mother on that show. I did BET, the Frankie and Nephew show in 2015, several episodes on that show as well. And I'll talk about that at the workshop as well. And it's all about giving you just a few more skills to add to yourself that you can do with your clientele to strengthen the foundation for the family. I used to teach at Argosy Atlanta here in Atlanta in their master's program for about seven years. Mm -hmm. and I just took a whole bunch of stuff that I've been teaching in class that I've done in supervision and pulled all that information together into a continuing education workshop to help those, to assist those in the field. We can strengthen families. It's, I'm all about strengthening families, helping families grow, even if you're a family of one. Yeah. Help you grow in the work that we do. The, the stronger the family is, the stronger the home is, you can greatly impact our nation. Yeah. That's what we have to do. Definitely. And the other, one of the other things we talk about is at the table and the significance of the table in our lives. But I'm gonna say that. For <laughs> but come, 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 all come who can come. The workshop, the next one I have is on Saturday, December the 1st, 2018. The workshop is a six hour ethics workshop. It will be from 9 to 4 30 in Douglasville, Georgia, at the Douglasville Conference Center. And it's every quarter next year 
four times next year in 2019, March, June, September, and December of next year. You can get more information at the SutherlandCenter.com. T H E S U T H E R L A N D C E N T E R dot com. And guys, I'll also include that information in the description box below as well. And also, if you follow me on social media at Legacy SBKS on everything, I will also be um, sending out the flyer and whatnot. That way you, got, you guys can connect with Dr. Sutherland. Um, one last question, because you are a supervisor as well. Um, what advice or what have you taught to your uh, supervisees about working if, within the community? I know you're very collectivist in nature um, and you are super super, super big on family. So how have you been able to take those proponents and apply it to supervision? I'm, I'm almost going to feel like I'm repeat, but I'm big <laughs> on Because everything is repetition. Yeah. You know, when you learn your alphabet, I, don't, I never met anybody who learned all 26 letters the first time they taught us to. Yeah. If you want to count as 52, if you had to learn upper and lower case, mm -hmm. everything is through repetition. With my supervisees, we're dialogue about how to strengthen the foundation of their clientele. But like I said, everything they got to do in their own home. Yeah. Don't sit there and go to somebody else's home who are you meeting because they pan you or because this is what you got to do for your work. Mm -hmm. And yet you're walking them through on how to express their anger in a healthy way or you're teaching them how to communicate effectively. And yet you haven't done it with your own home. You're mm -hmm. out of order. And everything that we do in supervision, I ask them and encourage them and push them to go do it in their own home. I asked my supervisees to be in therapy mindset all the time. Don't wait until you got your 45, 50 minute session that's gonna happen once a week or twice a week. You need to be in therapeutic mode and with every interaction that you have by listening and clarifying, summarizing, all those skills that you learn in school with every person that you meet, you need to be in that mindset. That way, when you come to session, you ain't got to figure out, okay, what am I supposed to do? No. Right. From the beginning, with every interaction, you need to be in that mindset of how to do the skill set that we're doing. It's one human being sitting in one in front of one, another human being, and you want to give them skills for everyday living. It's one human being sitting in front of another human being, and you want to give them skills for everyday living. And that's what we do. Amen. Awesome sauce. Dr. Sutherland, thank you so much for your time. Um, can you please let the people know where they can find you once again, just in case they didn't catch it before? Yeah, you can find me at the SutherlandCenter.com, www.thesutherlandcenter.com, the SutherlandCenter.com. You can call me as well, 770-853-6372. Awesome. And thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Legacy Speaks. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share, and stay connected via Legacy SBKS on everything. Until next time.